Imagine a virus so deadly it attacks all organs in the human body within a matter of days. So infectious, it lingers long after death on objects touched by its victims. A virus which inspires such fear that funeral rites are abandoned and bodies are left for corpse disposal squads. Imagine a world in which we are once again prey to incurable plagues. Now, stop imagining. In the spring of 1995, the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta, Georgia, received samples of a virus that was raging in the central African country of Zaire. Within hours, the scientists' worst fears were realized. They were dealing with Ebola, one of the deadliest viruses known to mankind. I think there's a very real possibility that Ebola could come out of Africa to the West, so we've got to get to the bottom of what controls the circulation of this virus and what controls its ability to hop over into humans and what controls its possibilities for spread. Ebola is a scientific enigma. Since little is known about how it's transmitted, once an outbreak begins, no place on Earth is safe. The World Health Organization sounded the alarm. Within days, an international SWAT team arrives in Kikwit Zaire, ground zero of the outbreak. Their mission is to stop the virus and find out where it came from. They greet each other with the Kikwit handshake, elbow to elbow to minimize contact. As the scientists make their way from the airport, they find themselves in a city gripped by terror. <laughs> the fear of Ebola is spreading. Thousands are trying to flee, but a military quarantine has been imposed. The ongoing surveillance activities will need a lean and mean team. They won't need a lot of excess fat, and that's what we're aiming for the right now. The international team of scientists sets up a command post. They join forces with a group of Zairean doctors who flew in from the capital. We're very glad to meet so many courageous people from abroad. It's what inspires us and encourages us to fight this to the end. Our families were in tears when we left the capital, Kinshasa, to come here because they knew we were traveling towards death. My wife believes in reincarnation, so the first thing she said was, if you die over there, I'll kill you, which didn't, wasn't very, uh, you know, didn't carry a lot of weight. And then she says, if you die over there, I will hunt you down through the ages and your future lives and will kill you. <laughs> so I'm being very careful. Despite the camaraderie, the African and Western approaches do not always match. I gave you a form on this person from Pesci that met the case definition. We need to talk about it in terms of forms. Yes, yes. This is the form, yes. this is the person. Mm -hmm. Did he or did he not meet the case definition? Yeah, we need yeah. to do that consistently yeah. instead oh, yes. of, mm -hmm. I heard about this person and I yes. heard about this person and yeah, I only know about this good. person. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One person from Vanga Sala and one person from Vanga Vanga yes. are missing from here because Every I don't have Ebola any Every Ebola case but must be documented. Yes. Missing well, even one missing could spell here, disaster. So The team fans out across the city to survey new cases and contain the epidemic. The scientists are excited by the outbreak. It presents a rare chance to do research into a mysterious virus. 
This is an incredible opportunity. There's not a Ebola outbreak very often. And I just have to keep remembering, do the surveillance as it contributes to disease control. So you're very tempted to go off in 20 different directions and start 20 different studies at the same time. This was not the first time that Ebola struck Zaire. Almost 20 years earlier, in 1976, an outbreak erupted in a hospital in the town of Yambuku, some 1,000 kilometers to the north. The disease spread rapidly, killing nine out of 10 of its victims. It left nearly 400 dead. Because an international team arrived late in the outbreak, it had little opportunity to investigate the virus. The epidemic was stopped when village elders ordered the temporary abandonment of traditional burial ceremonies that involved touching the corpse. Instead, they quarantined villages and burned down the huts of the dead. The 1995 outbreak also began at a hospital, the main medical facility in Kikwit. When we got there, the hospital was essentially deserted, the major hospital in Kikwit. There was a scattered patient here or there, uh, many of whom had not been fed for days on time. And we walked through that hospital the first night, and it's a sort of memories that you retain for a lifetime. The local situation was so bad on the medical point of view that we, at least two of us, were involved in the cleaning uh, of the ward. But there were still uh, dead people in the building, and the condition of work was very bad. The safety protection for the, for the worker were uh, absent, not available for them. The epidemic was traced back to a surgical procedure performed on a young lab worker named Kim Fumu. Within days, two nurses and an Italian nun who had assisted with the operation fell ill. Taking no special precautions, fellow hospital workers attended to their needs, washing them and coming into contact with their bodily fluids. Within weeks, 36 hospital workers, doctors, nurses, and attendants had died and most of the survivors fled. The government asked Zairean doctors for volunteers to come here. For at least two weeks, they didn't find any. But after a while, we said that we'll go to investigate and do research. It's at times like this that you can be part of medical history in the making. We said to ourselves, we're doctors. It's like the army. We're soldiers. We'll go and face the danger. Look here. It's a picture of daddy. Of course, I'm afraid. He's touching sick and dying people every day. I'm terrified he's going to catch it. This is a disease that is merciless. I pray to God that he doesn't get sick. I'm convinced that he won't get sick. I'm sure of that now. Outside the hospital, the grieving families of the sick and dying pray for their recovery, while the medical staff takes elaborate precautions to avoid infection. Despite the sweltering heat, the safety procedures established by the international team require four layers of protective gear. A moat with bleach is the only barrier between the Ebola ward and the outside world. Unlike HIV, Ebola is a hardy virus that can survive outside the human body. 
Any contact with patients or their surroundings may prove fatal. The virus has been found in tears, blood, even on the surface of the skin. There is no cure or treatment. Death usually comes within 10 days. She's in the terminal stages. There's nothing to be done. There's her husband. Patients in the early stages of the disease can only look on at what is likely to be their fate. Terrifying effects of Ebola were seen for the first time in Europe. During the summer of 1967 in the quiet German town of Marburg, workers at a pharmaceutical plant began dying of a mysterious ailment. As in Kikwit, the victims developed a strange rash. Their skin tore easily. The eyeballs filled up with blood. Their faces became fixed, zombie-like. They vomited black fluid and discharged blood containing high concentrations of the virus from every orifice. From the initial headache to death, one week. The lab workers had contracted the disease during the process of killing monkeys from Africa for the preparation of polio vaccine. The source of the virus was never found. It was a terrible uh, kind of uh, disease because all organs are involved. Uh, th the liver, the brain, kidneys, all, and it's uh, a failure of every organ taken together, so they suffer extremely. It must have been the same in the Middle Ages, where you don't know what happens and people die and know that they can get the disease from touching. In 1989, Ebola made its way to the United States. At the time, residents of this Washington, D.C. suburb had no idea that one of the world's deadliest viruses had emerged in their midst. In a primate quarantine unit in Reston, Virginia, monkeys in one of the holding rooms suddenly began to die. Secretly, a military team entered the facility and killed all 60 monkeys in the infected room. The crisis heightened as monkeys began to die in a different room. It appeared that the virus was moving through the building's ventilating system. In response, the military killed all 400 monkeys in the facility. The outbreak was over. The Marburg and Reston incidents demonstrate that Ebola can strike anywhere. The week the international team arrived, the epidemic in Kikwit exploded. I was actually very scared that this could get out of control. And there was no doubt that when you looked at the distribution of cases, it was just getting 
bigger and bigger and bigger every week. And that week, actually, there were 70 odd deaths in the community. I mean, you walk through the streets and people were dying. I mean, they were literally everywhere you walk, people, they were, they were talking about people dying of Ebola. We were working as hard as we could. So that week, I was extremely scared that this thing may be getting out of control. I coined the term chain of death, and it was very characteristic what you would see happening in a family. And there were a number of such number of such chains in the community where you would see one person become sick and then you would see their spouse or primary caregiver become sick and then four to five days later their primary caregiver would become sick and then you would just see this chain of death and you could just track it through the family until it eventually terminated. The one who died on the 20th was the mother. She's your mother, yes. And then the, and then the granddaughter, granddaughter, yes. granddaughter died next. Mm -hmm. So today's the first. So yes. that's, so she's Eight days the to break the chain of death, Dr. Ali Khan must track down all the cases and separate them from their families, even if it means interfering with the way people honor their dead. Another thing that was a factor in the outbreak is attending funerals. And we do know that during the preparation of a body, there's a lot of physical handling of the corpse. And then during the funeral itself, a large number of people may touch that body. And cultural things are difficult to change, obviously, because they are ingrained in the way people act. But what we had to do was simply say that if somebody dies of this disease, they immediately get put into a body bag, sprayed down with Lysol, popped in a coffin, and buried deep. Oh gods, we ask you to be with us in this hard time. This hospital has been our refuge, and now the devil has taken it. Please deliver us. The Red Cross team has the most thankless job of the epidemic. Members are shunned by their neighbors and regarded as pariahs in the villages. Their visit signals only tragedy. If Ebola was looking for a place to emerge, it could find no better environment than Kikwit. Kikwit is called a city, but it is more like a large rural village of some 400,000. It has no electricity, no sewage system, no running water, no telephones, and little health care. The illiteracy rate is upwards of 50%. The local diet includes insects, monkeys, and rats, all of which are suspected carriers of the virus. Under these conditions, the international team must somehow get the word out change your behavior or risk death. They organize a street-level education campaign. Banners are put up over the main road. The disease that makes your blood flow, this disease has no vaccine and no cure. You must protect yourself. It was very difficult to educate the public because there was no mass media. There's no TV, there was no radio, there was no newspapers. So everything had to depend on using alternative means to educate the community. Let 
This fever, this disease is harsh, and it's already killed many people. And I'm here to tell you that hiding patients won't help anybody. But what about the guy you buried over there? Now that it's raining, won't all this water spread the disease from the corpse through the neighborhood? Well, the Red Cross assured us that he was buried safely. He died in the outhouse and, and fell into the hole. It was very deep, so they buried him right there. Now, you shouldn't be scared. The Red Cross disinfected his grave and the surroundings. His remains can't come out, and his germs can't get you. Medical students are sent into the community to identify new cases before entire neighborhoods are infected. There's only one way to do this in Kekwit, door to door. It looks like no one's home. They're here. They just left when they saw us coming. We're here to get some information. What's all this? I don't understand. Why are you coming to disturb people? We're students from the University of Bandundu. We're doing research. We want to know if anyone here is sick with Ebola. This is not right. I'm innocent. I don't know anything about it. I worked with the medical students here in town, and the stories that I'm hearing, it seems very natural to me of the stigmatization, um, including the story of someone being killed um, because he was from Kikweed and was thought to have had contact. Uh, so it's natural to me that if you, you know, say to someone, tell us if you have Ebola and we'll take you away from your family and put you in the hospital where you'll likely die and no one will want to visit you. So certainly people don't want to tell you because of the stigma. In the Ebola ward, Dr. Mupapa and his team provide whatever human comfort they can. They must conceal the stress and frustration of treating patients that will likely die. Have courage. Each day as they leave, the medical staff is sprayed with stinging bleach, which kills the virus. Their protective clothing is burned to ensure that it won't be reused by hospital workers. But they can't so easily rid themselves of the images of the ward. I'm a newlywed. We have a child. My wife was really worried about me coming here, and she was pretty scared especially when we found out that the disease can be transmitted from a man to a woman through sperm. I write her as often as I can to tell her that everything's okay so far and that we are taking safety measures and that there's nothing to worry about. When I read his letters, I feel better, but even so, my heart is heavy. I will only be happy the moment he returns home. I pray every morning and every night. I'm really convinced that I'll return to Kinshasa alive. That's truly my most ardent wish. As night falls, the big movie hit in Kikwit is a video called Ebola. Made by a local entrepreneur, it stars Zairean doctors who have become local heroes. Although the video is projected from a broken down VCR, there isn't an empty seat in the house. It depends on when you think you got 
sick. His, his brother says he got sick on the 13th, which would have made it two days after the surgery. We didn't bring the good man. Five, that's it. But four days before he got sick, there was a young woman admitted for surgery who was pregnant, and when they opened her up, she had a hemorrhagic uterus. Not only was he there, but she died in the OR, and he was busy trying to resuscitate her, him and another. As the scientists gain confidence in their management of the crisis, their research mission takes on higher priority. One of the team's senior members is Dr. Robert Swanpole. He is driven by the idea of finding the source of the virus. When something like this happens, you're just drawn to it as to a magnet or a moth to a candle. You must go and find out where the devil this thing came from, and we really don't know. With rare diseases like Ebola, diseases that have not been properly studied, every epidemic has to be seen in two ways. It's, it's, it's an emergency to control the epidemic and save human lives, but at the same time, it's a responsibility to collect research data that will inform you about future epidemics. Between outbreaks, Ebola lives within one of the many thousands of insect or animal species that inhabit the rainforest but scientists have never succeeded in identifying which one. It's really a medical curiosity in these places. I mean, where does it hole up and how does it pop up here again in Zaire after 20 years? And I think it's a, that's what keeps a lot of us motivated and, and interested in this virus. I'm not sure what makes a good virologist. Now, certain Americans have sort of described the type of person I am as an uh, old-fashioned swamp-stomping epidemiologist, if you like. As long as the natural host goes unidentified, it is impossible to predict where the virus may strike next. Bats have been implicated in previous outbreaks, but despite years of searching, no one has ever found a bat with a trace of Ebola in its blood. This time, Dr. Robert Swanpole hopes to make a breakthrough. The team also tries to understand the strategy employed by Ebola once it infects a human being. Blood samples at different stages of the disease are collected by Dr. Pierre Rollin. <laughs> We know nothing on Ebola because during the 76 outbreak only few blood samples were taken. So our hope in this outbreak is to get enough sample from patients at different periods of the disease. An outbreak every 20 years is not like walking with a serial killer that have the same pattern all the time. The, the priority is to try to stop the outbreak first and then collect as much specimen that you can, so you can learn something. Roland works with infected blood in conditions far below laboratory safety levels. He risks his life handling samples which contain enough Ebola to kill thousands. Kikwit is still under siege. The Zairians have been fighting this epidemic for 10 weeks now, and more than 200 people have died. The burials go on, but fewer than before. The number of new cases continues to drop. Every victim has been traced, the chain of transmission well documented. The end is in sight. Back at the command center, the epidemiologists have been analyzing the accumulating data. Their efforts finally pay off with a dramatic breakthrough. 
they identify patient zero, the one they believe contracted the disease not from another human being, but from something in nature. All the cases have been charted on a timeline tracing a path of destruction back to the very first known victim. He died four months before the first case appeared at the hospital. His name was Gaspar Menga. Gaspar Menga was a charcoal worker living in Kikwit. He is survived by his brother Pierre and his father Innocent. They treasure a picture of Gaspar's funeral, which is now the extraordinary portrait of the start of an outbreak. Judo, Gaspar's son, is now dead. Michael, Gaspar's nephew, dead. Deceased. Deceased. I don't know the origins of this disease. Only God knows. I'm not a scientist, I'm a person. I too hope to learn its origin. Somewhere in this forest lives an organism which harbors the virus. Now the international team can focus their search on the area surrounding Gaspar Menga's home and work. What we have probably is a disease that occurs in nature and very accidentally uh, transfers to, to a human being. Now, what we've done is to try and follow the so-called index case, the first person who, who was infected and who essentially was the beginning of this terrible epidemic. They trace Menga's steps back to his last working place. This is a charcoal pit. It takes three months to do the entire process at one charcoal site, for which the man earns 15,000 zaires, which is about $3. Three months hard work. The gentleman who was the index case here uh, had nearly completed this pit. Rather uh, sadly, he left over here um, his hoe in the tree and a little bundle of cloth. And of course, nobody will touch that now. Searching the area around Menga's charcoal pit, Paul Reiter and his colleague Russ Coleman use a goat as bait, hoping to determine whether an insect might be Ebola's carrier. This disease is a, a great enigma. Uh, it has appeared only a few times in history. In every case, the tremendous contagious nature of the disease has captured people's imagination. This is a challenge of a kind that is very hard to describe. Of course, there's human tragedy involved, and we would like to think that the work that we do will help alleviate that kind of tragedy in the future. Other groups set out to trap rodents and small mammals in the hope that one of the captured specimens will prove to be Ebola's natural host. Males, welcome. 258. 258. Villagers look on with amusement as a spacesuited field team cautiously handles animals local people eat for lunch. There's a dead body in that house. I asked you yesterday if anyone was sick. You said no. So what stories are you going to tell me today? When we come here and ask if people are sick, they say no. To them, Ebola means bleeding. If they aren't bleeding, they're not sick. Now we find a dead body. The education campaign proves to be a double-edged sword. 
No longer mourned in traditional ceremonies, some victims are abandoned by their families who fear any contact may prove fatal. The medical students are forced to improvise as they discover a corpse teeming with Ebola. Close the door. Tie it shut. Wait, wait. Don't take them off like that, no. I know. Put them over there in the hole. No, we should burn them. Just take them and throw them over there. Yes, I know it's dangerous. Throw it in the hole. It's deep enough. It's dangerous for the kids. No, no, no. It's deep enough. Can't we burn them? The Red Cross teams are now welcome visitors as elaborate funeral rites give way to chillingly efficient disposal. Although Ebola is a ruthless killer, it is not totally without mercy. The medical team now finds that one in five patients are still alive. They survived Ebola. These convalescents no longer show symptoms of the illness. The virus, however, remains in their blood and can be transmitted through their bodily fluids. As a result, they are still confined to the hospital. No one knows why these patients developed the antibodies that saved them. Since there is no cure for the virus, I know that God must have cured me. God cured me. Suddenly, a frightening new case arises. Yesterday, we admitted a new case, one of our nurses. She's here in the emergency ward now, and the clinical diagnosis is Ebola. To see a nurse with whom you've worked every day sick with this disease is terrible, and I really don't want to see her die. Nicole Organia worked alongside the doctors. Despite wearing full protective gear, she became infected. The doctors suddenly feel vulnerable. The Zairians devise a plan, an experiment. They know that the blood of survivors has antibodies against the virus. If they transfuse Nicole with that blood, perhaps those antibodies will save her. They take Nicole's blood, but before they can decide to proceed with their plan, they must find out if there's an available convalescent with the same blood type.
As the battle for Nicole's life begins, few new cases show up in the isolation ward. The containment strategies are finally working. Going about their rounds, the Zairean doctors know that with each passing hour, Nicole's chances for survival decline. Frustrated at their helplessness, they become increasingly convinced that they must execute their plan to save Nicole's life. If the experiment works, maybe they can use it on all these last cases trickling in. The foreign members of the team are against the treatment. They believe it is too risky. There's basic risks in giving an individual blood products from someone else. There's a lot of infectious risks. There's um, HIV is very prevalent. There's hepatitis B, hepatitis C. Certainly in that setting, one of the greatest concerns would be if the person that you're treating doesn't have Ebola, they have malaria or typhoid or something else, and the person that you're getting the transfusion from still has Ebola virus circulating in their blood is, and is infectious, that that would be the worst thing you could do is to give someone who didn't have Ebola, Ebola. The Zairians test Nicole's blood and find a convalescent with matching type. Now they must make a decision. Realizing that the foreign doctors will be opposed, they meet privately. What if we transfuse convalescent plasma to someone who doesn't have Ebola? What if our diagnosis is wrong? It's clearly a clinical case. It's obvious she has Ebola. We shouldn't doubt our diagnosis. We've seen so many cases now. We should at least wait until tomorrow. In the meantime, let's present and defend our position in front of the scientific community. What do you think? In America, they don't believe in transfusing patients with convalescent blood, but... Never mind, we should answer to ourselves. I think we have to try this experiment. Maybe not on every one of these last few cases, but at least on our nurse. Personally, I think we could have transfused her this morning. The diagnosis is clearly Ebola, so I don't see why we should wait another 24 hours. Okay, I think we all agree that we do the transfusion. And that we should do it as soon as possible. The doctors approach the convalescent patient whose blood type matches Nicole's. He agrees to participate in their experiment. Unbeknownst to the international community, they collect his blood and get ready to transfuse. They only have the means to run a quick AIDS test. As a result, Nicole runs the risk of contracting any other disease that may be in the donor's blood. The cure may kill her. Transfusion experiments with animals had failed in the past. Nicole is being used as a human guinea pig. The doctors ask her to sign her consent before they proceed. Transfusion is interrupted by a doctor from the Belgian Institute of Tropical Medicine. Nonetheless, the Zairean doctors proceed. That night, Dr. Masamba, head of the Zairean team, defends the transfusion at a hastily convened international meeting. We felt compelled to try something new. There is no treatment. Tell us if there's something else we can do and we'll do it. But we all know there's nothing. That's why we did the transfusion. We asked our nurse if she wanted us to do the procedure and she consented in writing. 
As for transfusing whole blood, we simply don't have the means here to sterilize human plasma. We felt compelled to try something. Now we'll just wait and see what happens. In the days following the transfusion, everyone waits to see whether Nicole will survive. The tension is palpable. Four days after the transfusion, Nicole seems to be improving. I'm eating now, I go out, I wash myself, and I can get up without any help. Our nurse is doing better. I'm really relieved. I think that after Nicole, other people who get sick may want us to try this same treatment. And personally, I think it will work. A week later, Nicole seems to be fully recovered. Encouraged by their success, the Zairean doctors transfuse eight more patients. Seven survive. The Western doctors remain unconvinced. It would not be my choice to have given these blood transfusions. On the other hand, with the pressure to do something, I can absolutely understand why these experiments were done. I think what's unfortunate from my point of view, is that we'll never know whether this worked or not. There's other possible explanations that late in the epidemic, the, the virus may be less virulent after several passages through human hosts. There's the possibility that late in the epidemic, people were having less exposure, that there was some awareness, so people were being more careful, so they were getting smaller um, viral loads when they were getting infected. So the ideal thing would have been to have one group get the transfusions and have one group not get them or get a placebo transfusion. Unfortunately, it's not something we can study in humans. You certainly aren't going to give someone Ebola to, to do a trial like that. We have to wait for a, an, an epidemic situation to do that. The transfused patients are the last in the ward. No more cases appear. The epidemic is over. The international team is getting ready to leave. In a matter of weeks, 316 people had become infected with Ebola, and 244 of them had died. The samples collected will go to various labs for analysis. They may hold the clues that will help solve the Ebola mystery. It's a very, very difficult and critical period. We're in a transition. Everyone came to help. That's wonderful. They helped us a lot. And for that, we are very grateful to the international community. But now that the epidemic is over, we have to try to manage the crisis that caused this. And everyone is leaving. All that is going back? Yes. That too. Yes, that too, yeah. Don't mix up with what is arriving. It's too bad you're leaving so soon. It's been 18 days. I've stayed longer than anyone else. The international intervention was a success. Despite the occasionally conflicting agendas, a hastily assembled group of Zairean and foreign scientists had won the battle. A world pandemic had been averted for the time being. <laughs>